Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark. We last were in Mark two weeks ago, and you remember uh, we finished up chapter 4. Jesus had been on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. He was teaching the people in parables. There was such a large crowd that he sat in a boat out in the water and taught them. At the end of that, he told his disciples, let's go over to the other side. And so they journeyed across the sea, and late that night, a storm came up suddenly, as they do on the Sea of Galilee, and it was such a threatening storm that they thought they were going to sink. They were bailing out the boat, and it seemed to be a losing battle, and Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat. They woke him, don't you care that we're perishing? He got up, calmed the sea, rebuked the wind and the waves, it calmed down, and they were left in amazement, asking themselves, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? That's how the fourth chapter ends, and they're about to get their answer here in the fifth chapter, and we'll look at verses 1 through 20. They came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerasenes, When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. And no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demon implored him, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission. And coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. The herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country, And the people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion. And they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine And they began to implore him to leave their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. And he did not let him, but said to him, Go home to your own people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's pray. Australia was once a penal colony. I think most of you know that. English convicts who were sent there had a grim name for it, The Fatal Shore. An old ballad told how the day they landed upon the Fatal Shore, they were sold 
and chained up to plows. That would have been an appropriate name for the country of the Gerasenes, the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee where Jesus and his 12 disciples landed one dark morning in Mark 5. There were chains there. It was a land of pig farmers who cared more about pigs than people. A lurid land where the first person Jesus met was a maniac who came screaming out of the darkness at him. When they arrived, the disciples must have stepped onto dry land with a great sense of relief. They had just come through a typhoon. They were perishing when Jesus calmed the sea. So I can imagine when they got out of that boat, they felt like kissing the ground that they stood on. Well, if that was their sense and they felt relief, it didn't last long. Mark writes in verse 2 that when Jesus got out of the boat, immediately... That's Mark's word in his action-packed gospel. Immediately, a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. I called him a maniac. That's how he behaved. A modern psychoanalyst would be more specific and diagnose him as paranoid schizophrenic with multiple personalities. And that might describe his symptoms, but really it doesn't get to the root cause of his affliction, which was satanic. He had an unclean spirit. He was demon-possessed. Now, in the West today, that would be dismissed as ridiculous. The West is under the influence of a naturalistic worldview. We're guided the spirit of the age for the most part is guided by materialism. The idea therefore that angels and demons exist is dismissed as primitive and superstitious. The physical, the material is all there is and explains all. In a recent book titled Madness and Civilization, the author Andrew Skull traces the history of man's attempt to understand and cure madness. In his chapter, one of the early ones on madness in the ancient world, he wrote that the Hebrews turned to the notion of possession by evil spirits to explain insanity. And the idea that he's communicating there is that that's ancient man. We've, we've moved beyond that. And yet at the end of the book, he concludes by stating, and he's analyzed all the different attempts to deal with insanity from ancient times to modern times and the different schools of thought and the way people have treated it and analyzed it, Freudianism and all of that. And he comes to the end and he concludes, concludes much as psychiatry might wish it otherwise, madness remains an enigma, a mystery we seemingly cannot solve. Still a mystery. So difficult to dismiss certain things if you don't understand it. Now the Bible doesn't teach that demons are the cause of all madness. There are lots of causes, I think. Physical causes. Uh, disease accounts for some of that. Chemical imbalance. Uh, there, there is enough evil in the world and sickness in the human heart to explain a lot. But Scripture does teach that Satan exists and that he and his devils are at work in the world for evil. Shakespeare's words still apply today. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. And if we take the Bible seriously, we must believe that. And here in Mark 5, on the shore of the Gerasenes, Jesus and the twelve met a maniac driven by an unclean spirit. He was as tragic as he was terrifying. He was alienated from mankind. He lived a lonely existence among the dead, among the tombs. That itself is creepy. 
in Cairo, Egypt, there is a large cemetery called the City of the Dead. It's very old. Forty years ago, or a little over that, I drove by it. It looks like a city. It has roads, it has streets, it has houses. They're tombs made to look like houses. It was occupied only with corpses when I saw it. Now, due to urban renewal and a lack of housing, poor people have moved in to the houses and they occupy the city of the dead. Poverty compelled that. But this man chose to live in the tombs and among the dead. That is unnatural and shows how deeply disturbed this man was. He was a man who was enamored of death, dwelling among the tombs. We learn other things about him from Matthew and Luke. He wore no clothes. And he was extremely violent. He would waylay travelers, making the roads impassable. Matthew also records that there were two of them. Mark focuses only on one, on this man. There's no contradiction between Matthew's account and Mark's account. Mark just focuses upon this particular individual for whatever reason. We're not told, but perhaps he was the ringleader. Perhaps he was the most dangerous. He was not only extremely violent, he was very strong. Mark says that numerous times the men of the region had tried to arrest him and bound him with chains and shackles, but to no avail, every time he broke the chains and the shackles to pieces. He was uncontrollable. And he was out there. Everyone knew it, like Frankenstein's monster terrorizing the villagers and giving the Chamber of Commerce fits. Who was going to come visit their region with a maniac on the loose? But he was not only a menace to others, he was a menace to himself. Mark says in verse 5 that constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. What an eerie thing that must have been to hear this man out there in the hills screaming. That's the region he lived in. That's what it was like. He was miserable. He was a wretched man. This was a fatal shore Jesus had stepped onto. An eerie and frightening country. But really, that's the world. That's really a picture of the world into which the Lord had entered. Jesus, uh, John tells us that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Jesus said of him that he was a murderer from the beginning and the father of lies. Go back to the very beginning. Go back to Genesis chapter 3 and there he is. It's the serpent, but we know there's more than a serpent there in the garden. And he's full of lies, very clever lies with terrible results. Satan promises the world and doesn't deliver. Satan promises light but gives darkness, freedom and joy that end in slavery and misery. This earth is filled with chains. Wayne Grudem in his systematic theology wrote that one distinguishing mark of many non-Christian religions is that their most devoted adherents engage in religious rituals that destroy one or several aspects of humanity. And then he lists destruction in such aspects as their physical health, their mental or emotional stability, or their human sexuality as God intended it to function. Again, the human heart has enough evil to explain a lot of what happens in the world. Jeremiah spoke on that. You know the, the passage in Jeremiah 17, 9 where he describes the heart. He says, it is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? 
Well, no wonder psychiatrists and psychologists and those who deal with the mind can't understand it because it's beyond us. Who can understand it? But you can't help but feel that there is evil outside of man at work in the world that explains the irrational, mindless destruction of self and others. The, the madman of Mark 5 is an exhibit of that. And no one in the country of the Gerasenes could fix it. They were helpless against this force of evil. And more had no concern for the man. They were compassionless, as we will see. The world this man lived in was as cold as the tombs he dwelt among. The citizens of the region showed as much callousness as the demons practiced cruelty. Not Jesus. He is the King. He is the Savior. He has compassion and composure. When the man first saw him, he ran up to him. He came at him with hostile intent. The word used in verse 2, met him, is a word that's used of kings meeting in battle. And that was what he intended here. And that's what he did. He terrorized people. He, he traumatized. He, tra he thrashed people. And Jesus had invaded his domain and, and he charged in an attempt to drive him out. But Jesus didn't flee. He didn't flinch or fear. He calmly stood his ground. And the man fell at his feet. Suddenly realized who Jesus was and bowed down before him. Not in worship, that is not in adoration, but in homage homage to a superior. In fact, I think as you think about this, you might see a picture of, of the end of the age when the Lord comes again. And Paul speaks of this in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10. He says, every knee will bow. He's quoting the Old Testament. And he says, in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, all will bow. Not necessarily in worship, but they will bow in recognition that He is the Son of God and the King of Kings, and they will show that. They will be forced to, compelled to. Well, that was this man. He comes up, as it were, to do battle, to thrash this invader of his territory, and he falls down before him. He was in the presence of God, and he acknowledged that, acknowledged Christ as King. Verse 7. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. In Matthew's account, he calls Jesus Son of God. And the plea, do not torment me, is put in a fuller question. Have you come here to torment us before the time? So we learn that the man has more than one unclean spirit. He speaks as we and us. We also learn what they knew and what we might call the theology of hell. Surprisingly, or well, maybe not so surprisingly, it's good theology. That is, it's correct theology. They know the Lord's identity. He's the Son of God. He's the Son of the Most High God. They confess His deity. They believe in the Trinity. And they know something of God's plan. They know their destiny, which is judgment, eternal torment, and that Jesus is the one who will bring about their demise. They know it as part of the divine plan and, and ha that it has been determined and that's clear from the way they speak of it, at least in, in Matthew's account. They speak of it as the time. Torment us before the time. They believed in that moment, in that destiny, in that end for themselves, and it terrified them. It's ironic, I think, that the, the demon who so viciously tormented the man begs not to be tormented. 
which indicates something about the essence of evil, I think. It is um, full of self-interest, or better, full of selfishness, concern only for self and not others. And that was this demon or these demons. They, they knew something. And, and that was that the reality of their end was true. They knew that. And it was terrible. It, they, they were in fear of hell. It was inevitable. They knew that. But they wanted to put it off as long as possible. Uh, what, a, what a contrast to our day when not much serious thought is given to the things that they're thinking about here. Not much serious thought given to hell and the judgment to come, or even more seriously, not much serious thought given to Jesus Christ, who He is, the Son of God. God, if there is a God, people think, is love. He's not a judge. That's old-fashioned. All will be well. The demons know better and are under no illusions. They give a lot of thought to the future. They are evidently preoccupied with it. It terrifies them, as it should. It's endless punishment. So they were bowing, but they were resisting our Lord. And Jesus was telling them to come out of the man, and they were pleading with him almost get a sense that they're trying to strike a deal with him, bargaining, come out, well, let's, let's talk about this. Finally, he asks the man, what is your name? The answer was ominous. He said, my name is Legion, for we are many. A legion was a unit of the Roman army numbering over 6,000 soldiers, 6,000 infantry, and 120 horsemen. So they were many. But the significance of legion may not lie in the numbers only, but also in the power and, and, and cruelty of the army within him. The Roman legions marched across the world, conquering and destroying lives in places, occupying the lands they invaded with an iron fist. They were the powerful arm of Caesar. This legion was the arm of Lucifer, and it occupied this man cruelly. He was helpless. They drove him to madness so that he screamed and he cut himself day and night. He needed a deliverer, one who was greater than the strong man, greater than legion, stronger than the prince of demons, stronger than Beelzebub, the devil, and that man was Christ. Verse 10, and he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Luke wrote that they were entreating him not to command them to de depart into the abyss, the place of confinement before the final judgment. Peter calls it the pit of darkness. They don't want to go there. They plead for mercy these who showed no mercy. Now Mark writes in verse 11, there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. And the demons were begging him, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Well, it's worth noting that while the, the demons know a lot, they knew God's plan and purpose. They knew who Jesus was. They knew why he was here. He knew, they knew why he had come into the world. And they knew, their, they knew their doom was sure. Nevertheless, all they wanted was a delay of the inevitable. They don't repent. The demons never repent. They, they always remain demons. Don Carson wrote, To know Jesus yet hate Him is demonic. It is. And it's foolish. And it's madness. Now, the Bible doesn't give a lot of information on demons, just enough to know that they are and that they are bad. We don't need to fixate on such things. In fact, I think, to my mind, 
when we consider who Satan is, the importance of him, we would think there'd be a lot more in the Bible about him and his plans and machinations and his, his legions and his armies, but we really don't have a great deal on him. We have enough, though, to know who he is and what he does and the danger that we face and the nature of the battle. But I think the scriptures, I think the Lord doesn't want us to fixate on that, fix our minds on Christ, on the Savior, and as we walk in him and obey him, we overcome the evil one. Well, we don't know much about them, but one thing it, that seems to be clear from the demons is they, they desire to inhabit bodies. They are spirits, they want a body, and so they plead, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. And Jesus did. And Jesus gave them permission, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. That gives some idea of the kind of frenzy the demons caused in the mind of the man. They were so intolerable to the pigs that they drove them to self-destruction. They created such darkness in the man's soul that, that he he felt at home among tombs, had so little self-respect that he went about naked, practicing self-mutilation, and screamed night and day. That is what Satan produces, self-loathing and self-destruction. That is the nature of life in his domain. It is seen here in the the frantic destruction of the herd of swine. Only a little earlier, Jesus said, still the storm and calm the sea. And the disciples asked themselves in amazement, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So here they're given the answer to that. First from the demons and then from the Lord. He is son of the most high God. He's the Son of God. He's the master of the sea as he demonstrated, and now he's the master of the spirits as he has demonstrated. He's master of heaven and earth. But isn't this a sad end for the pigs? It raises a couple of questions, and most importantly, a moral question, why would Jesus grant the demon's request and allow him to destroy the poor pigs? That question has been asked in his book, Why I Am Not a Christian. The British philosopher Bertrand Russell listed this incident as one reason that he was not a Christian. Jesus wasn't nice to the pigs. But the drowning of the herd not only caused the death of innocent animals, it also caused the loss of their owner's livelihood. So it's not just the pigs, what about the owners as well? So did Jesus have the moral authority to do that? And did this serve any good purpose? The answer to both questions is yes. First, as the demons confessed, he's the son of God, son of the most high God. Christ is the ultimate owner of the herd. He's the creator of this world. And just as he is master of the elements, he's master of the animals. By the way, those who feel sorry for the pigs should know that they weren't headed for the petting zoo, but for the butcher shop in the breakfast table. Uh, even uh, the, the liberal William Barclay pointed out that those who feel sorry for the pigs and criticize Jesus, their sympathy usually doesn't extend far enough to prevent them from eating them. But secondly, there was a good reason for the stampede of the herd. It demonstrated to those who witnessed it that the man had actually been freed of the demons. In verse 14, Mark states that the herdsmen ran away to the city and reported what had happened. And that leads to the third and most important reason for the loss of the herd. 
It became a test for the people. It became a way of exposing their values, showing them what was really important to them. It showed they preferred pigs to people, and, and most importantly, it showed that they preferred the swine to the Savior. Verse 15, they came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion. And they became frightened. Well, that wasn't the fear of reverence, but the fear of dread and loathing. In verse 17, Mark states, they began to implore him to leave their region. That's interesting. The word implore, implore is the same word that's used of the demons imploring him in verse 12. They're no different from the legion. They preferred pigs to profit, uh, pigs and profit to Christ. They preferred that to the Savior of the world. Jesus has delivered them from the great scourge of their country. He, he is now at, at rest at Jesus' feet. He's clothed. He's, he's thinking clearly. He, he is in his right mind. This terrible thing that has terrified that region is now gone. It's a new person. And what's their response? They want Jesus to leave. In the book, Madness and Civilization, the author defines madness as massive and lasting disturbances of reason, intellect, and emotions. Well, their response meets that definition. It's not at all reasonable. There were then some significant reasons for allowing the drowning of the herd. It was not some careless act of destruction. It has a clear set of purposes, not the least of which was to expose the upside down priorities of the people. They were grossly materialistic. They cared more about the pigs they lost than the man who was saved and rejected Christ because of their love of money. And this was a Gentile crowd. So opposition to Christ is is not exclusively a Jewish trait. So far, that's what we've been seeing in the Gospel of Mark. But this is typical of fallen human nature. This is man. And there but for the grace of God go all of us. But because of grace, because of God's mercy, we who have believed in Christ are like this man. What a picture of salvation he gives. The man who lived among the tombs is now sitting at Jesus' feet. What a deliverance. What a deliverance that is. It's what Paul describes salvation to be in Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, a rescue. God transferred us from the domain of darkness, he said, into the kingdom of light, and he did that through the sacrifice of his son. In times past, we were all living in the city of the dead. That's the world. It looks like a normal place. It ha it, with, with, with houses and streets, that's the world. It looks so normal, but the reality is it's a vast cemetery where people are spiritually dead and moving closer every day to the grave. But we've been delivered from that. We're now citizens of heaven. And every day we move closer to eternal glory, to eternal rest, to the resurrection and the kingdom to come. That's our future. But even now we have a glorious, wonderful present. We have life now, what Jesus called eternal life now. It's our, our present possession and well illustrated here in this man who was restless, who was naked, who was full of shame, who was tormented, but now is at rest, clothed 
in his right mind, sitting at the feet of the Savior. Oh, well, that's the child of God. We're robed in the righteousness of Christ, and so we are at rest. We are justified. We've been forgiven fully and forever, and we are accepted by God fully and forever. What a blessing. Do you understand the blessing of justification that through faith alone in the Savior you are made right with God for all eternity and that can never change. You can never be more perfect in the eyes of God than you are at the moment of faith. Amen. And this man has a sound mind and that's what God gives to us. In fact, no one was more in his right mind in all of the country of the Gerasenes than this man who had been its madman. Now, what all of this demonstrates is no one is really of sound mind until he or she comes to Christ. No one has a sound mind until his or her mind has been renewed, transformed by Jesus Christ. And we're always in that process. We're being transformed through the Word of God daily, constantly. That's why you're here. This whole day, this whole morning, this whole exercise of, of worshiping together and studying the Word of God is to renew your mind, to transform it. And that's, this is how God does that. And the man showed just how renewed his mind was and how, how rational he had become when in verse 18, Jesus gets into the boat and he implores the Lord that he might accompany him. That is real evidence of spiritual change. That is real evidence of a right mind. A person wants to follow Christ, wants to be with him. But Jesus who had granted the request of the demons and was granting the request of the, the villagers by leaving, wouldn't grant the man his request. He said to him, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. A New Testament scholar J. Gresham Machen wrote, The relationship of Paul, Machen was a great student of the Apostle Paul, one of the authorities in his day on Paul and his theology. So he's speaking of the Apostle Paul, but what he says here applies to all. The relationship of Paul to Christ is a relationship of love. And that love is rooted not in what Christ has said, but in what Christ has done. He loved me and gave himself for me. There lies the basis of the religion of Paul. There lies the basis of all Christianity. And that's true. Christianity is Christ. What he said is important. What he said is true. His teaching is valuable. But Christianity is Christ in this sense. It is who he is and what he did. And what he did is redeem sinners through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. That is the great mainspring of action in the Christian life. What he has done for us. And it's the reason this man obeyed immediately and gladly why he became an evangelist for Christ, why he responded to the Lord's instruction immediately and fully. It's because God had changed him. It's because Christ has shown mercy to him, and he gladly responded. I began the lesson with a reference to an old ballad by the convicts who called Australia the fatal shore where guilty men were put in chains and made to work for a master. It was fatal for them. That's what every one of us is born into when we enter this world. We're born into chains. We are guilty, slaves of sin in the domain of the devil. It is a fatal shore. And we don't even know it. 
Men don't even realize it. But Jesus said, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you've been set free. And you've been set free into true freedom. The chains you could not break, He broke. You and I have no idea what direction our life might have taken had the Lord not shown mercy to us. This world we live in is full of so much danger, so much evil. It is such a lurid and dark place, and we don't even see it. But that's the nature of it. What God has saved us from, we have no idea. The missteps and the sorrow that might have been yours, you might easily have been a man or a woman among the tombs. And all of that is just a hint What we have escaped in this life is just a hint of what is to come for all eternity for the unbeliever in the lake of fire, an endless punishment. Thomas Watson, the old Puritan, wrote of that place, time will not finish it, tears will not quench it. The demons were right to fear it. They couldn't escape it, but people can. They can flee the wrath to come by fleeing in faith to the Savior. If you're here and you've never believed in Christ, come to Him. Worldly wise men don't. They find their excuses for why they are not Christians, but they are fools. There's no greater madness than unbelief. So shake off the madness. Come to Christ. He gives forgiveness. He gives a right mind, and He gives everlasting life to all who do. Father, we have read how those demons dreaded what was to come, and yet we can sing with Wesley, no condemnation, now I dread. Why? Because of Christ, Your Son. We thank You for Him, for His death for us, and the righteousness with which we are clothed as a result of faith, In Him, faith in His finished sacrifice for us. We thank You for Him. Thank You for all that we have from You. Your grace and Your mercy. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.